Welcome to this uh, a Friday lecture. Um, this is a original uh, collaboration, we haven't worked together before, between the East Asia Center here at UVA, which has talks often at this time, um, at, almost every week. So if you're interested in Asia topics, look for additional um, lectures in the East Asia Center series. And our partner is the US-Japan Research Institute, which is located in Washington, DC. It's a, it's a consortium of leading Japanese universities, including Doshisha University from Kyoto, where uh, Professor Murata uh, works, and several other leading universities um, work together as a, to provide a, a base that can facilitate visits and research trips, as well as lectures by Japanese um, academics. So it, such a thing did not used to exist, and I think it's a great sign of Japan's outreach to the world that the universities are investing in this type of a program and helping to support visits by people like Professor Murata. So thanks to both of our sponsors. Um, Koji Murata is professor of politics at Doshisha University in Kyoto. Until not too long ago, he was the dean of the faculty of law and then the president of the university. Um, it's rare that somebody combines that level of service to his university with active engagement with the foreign policy community in Tokyo and active research agenda in the study of foreign policy and writing about Japan's foreign and security policy. Um, he was named under Pr Prime Minister Abe to the NHK Board of Governors, which provides guidance to Japan's public broadcast station. Um, he's known as one of Mr. Abe's friends on this board. And <laughs> he is also a, he has recently been named as senior advisor to the defense, the new defense minister, Kono Taro, who is um, also a friend of mine from back at when we both went to Georgetown. So um, it's great to see um, Mr. Kono uh, having uh, picked up an appreciation for the academic study of foreign affairs in the United States as a college student, is continuing to network with academics both in the United States and Japan uh, as he helps uh, formulate Japan's security policy in a difficult era. It turns out that it's difficult to simultaneously navigate the waters of academic leadership and Japanese foreign policy. After uh, Mr. Murata expressed um, support for Prime Minister Abe's plan to reinterpret Article 9. He faced a huge backlash from his colleagues back at Doshisha University, and they agitated to get him removed from the presidency. So um, that is an interesting sign of the continuing strand of pacifism and support for Article 9, at least in academia in Japan. And um, that's part of Japan's challenge today as it navigates that kind of domestic politics which is constraining Japan's security role and its changing international environment, which includes, of course, the rise of China, um, North Korean missiles landing in the water near Japan, and recently conflict with South Korea, which canceled its intelligence cooperation with Japan over disagreements. So at a time like this, Japan more than ever needs the United States. The US-Japan alliance has been at the very center of Japan's security strategy for 70 plus years. And now um, the additional challenge that Japan gets to navigate is our president, President Trump, and his uh, make, make America Great Again, J America First uh, foreign policy, which has raised some questions about how reliable the United States will be as an ally. So um, there's some important strategic thinking going on in Tokyo right now about how they should navigate these situations. And I look forward to learning a lot from Professor Murata today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, oh, Dr. Chopra, for your kind introduction. And also, thank you very much uh, uh, Dr. Philip Parra of National Security uh, Studies Center of this university. It is my great honor to have a chance to speak be before you in this uh, 
wonderful, beautiful campus of the University of Virginia. Uh, let me begin to uh, speak about a bit of history. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, some Americans argue that now Japan's economy was more dangerous than Soviet military or the United States. But uh, uh, soon after that, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. The Cold War finally ended. Then uh, some Americans again said that a true winner of the Cold War was not the United States, but Japan. Because Japan uh, devoted itself for economic development without paying enough uh, military budget protected by the United States. And the United States uh, exhausted itself uh, through uh, military tension with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So uh, the largest, uh, biggest uh, beneficiary, the uh, true winner of the Cold War was not the United States, but Japan. Uh, some, some people argued so at the end of the Cold War. So, well, uh, still, uh, it is difficult to evaluate uh, 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 the value of the U.S.-Japan alliance for Japan and for the United States. For example, even recently, uh, the dear leader of this country, uh, President Donald Re uh, Trump, uh, says that uh, if Japan is attacked by other countries, the United States should protect Japan. But if the United States should be, should be attacked by other countries, Japan is not obliged to protect the United States. Probably Japanese will only watch the event through the Sony TV. Uh, Mr. Trump said so. Well, uh, it, somehow uh, his remarks is correct and somehow incorrect, I guess. The difficulty is the basic characteristics of the U.S.-Japan alliance is, according to some Japanese diplomat long time ago, that is the exchange between the human factors and material factors. The human factor means the Americans uh, deploy a uh, great amount of uh, uh, military in, the, in Japan. So uh, as uh, Mr. Trump uh, pointed out, if Japan should be attacked by the others, the US military, Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force will protect Japan. So in this sense, Americans, young Americans like you, might die for protecting Japan. So this is the human factors. But on the other hand, Japan provide military facilities and bases for the, for the United States. And uh, uh, the United States can enjoy the military facilities and the bases in Japan, not only for protecting Japan, but only for promoting American national interest in Asian Pacific region as a whole. So Japan provides uh, material uh, uh, factors such as uh, military bases and facilities. And the U.S. provides soldiers, uh, sailors, marines, and so on. So the U.S.-Japan alliance is an exchange between human factors and uh, material factors. It means that, you know, for American perspective, if something contingency happens, we might have to die for protecting Japan, right? So American blood will be spent. So this is very precious. But on the other hand, for the Japanese perspective, contingency will never happen, you know? For the past 60 years, no contingency happened in Japan, right? No country uh, tried to attack Japan. So nothing happened on the soil of Japan. And for 60 years, 60, 70 years, the United States has enjoyed uh, utilizing uh, military facilities bases in Japan freely, right? And for 60 years and 70 years, many Japanese, in particular people in Okinawa, suffered from noises, troubles, crimes, 
uh, uh, from the US military, uh, stationing the US military. So American can feel that we share more burdens than Japanese. But the Japanese also can feel that, no, 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 no. In crisis, Americans may pay a lot, but crisis may not never come. And in peacetime, we Japanese pay a lot of uh, uh, sacrifice uh, to accept a host American uh, military in Japan. So we Japanese pay a lot for a long, long time in peacetime. So both sides can feel that uh, this relationship is somehow unfair. That we share more burdens than others. This is a basic weakness of the, our alliance. But uh, I don't think, uh, uh, Mr. Trump says that the US-Japan alliance is unfair, but I don't think this alliance is unfair. Uh, um, but, but structure is asymmetric, asymmetrical, but I don't think it is unfair relationship. Uh, then, coming into the 21st century, September 11, 2001, as everybody knows, uh, this country and the entire world suffered from a terrible terrorist attack. On that day, I happened to be in Phoenix, Arizona. So I clearly remember that uh, uh, tragic incident. So uh, 2001, the world experienced uh, uh, global terrorism, 9-11. But uh, people may forget that. The same year, 2001, two more important events happened in international politics. One is China joined World Trade Organization, WTO. So since then, China began to become a great economic power. Another important event happened in 2001. It was Mr. Vladimir Putin uh, became the president of Russia. So since 2001, the United States spent more and more energy and budget and personnel uh, to fighting against global terrorism and two major wars in Afghanistan and Iraq in the Middle East, and, and China getting, uh, be becoming more and more economic superpower, and Russia again began to be uh, uh, quite assertive or provocative, in particular, uh, military arena in 2001. Then, 2008, this country again suffered from the Lehman shock, uh, serious economic setback. The, the same year, 2008, again, uh, one more, uh, several important uh, uh, events happened in the world. 2008, China successfully uh, sponsored uh, Beijing Olympic. Uh, so uh, China now uh, really began superpower. Then another thing is Russia invaded Georgia, right? So uh, uh, entering into the 21st century, China became a, a global superpower and Russia uh, became again uh, quite assertive, provocative military power. And 2008, in terms of domestic politics in this country, the first Afro-American president was elected, Mr. Uh, uh, Barack Obama, and uh, uh, Mr. Obama assumed the presidency in 2009. The 2009, in Japan, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, LDP, long-time governmental party, lost uh, the power. So democratic, power, uh, democratic Party of Japan came to power. So big change happened both in the United States and in Japan in terms of domestic politics. Uh, I would say, uh, uh, also LDP, long-time governmental party of Japan, lost power 2008. But Mr. Abe, uh, he's not my friend actually, uh, uh, I know him though, uh, Mr. Abe came back uh, to power two, uh, three years later, 2012. Then I would say 
the relationship, a personal uh, relationship of uh, a political leadership between the two countries. Uh, uh, my frank view is that the relationship, uh, Miss, Mr. Abe and Mr. Obama are quite different uh, 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 politicians. Uh, Mr. Abe represents uh, conservative uh, horses uh, in, in the Japanese politics, and Mr. Obama, of course, represents liberal uh, side of American politics uh, government. And uh, uh, Mr. Abe is a typical, he, he comes from a typical political family, you know. His father was a foreign minister, his grandfather was a prime minister, and his grand-grand-uncle was also a, a prime minister. So uh, he was a kind of a political celebrity. But on the other hand, Mr. Obama, the first Afro-American uh, president of this country, he's a typical meritocracy, right? Uh, he comes from the middle-class family and uh, Afro-American background, uh, studying Columbia, Harvard, so typical meritocracy. The Mr. Abe is typical aristocracy typical aristocracy, conservative aristocracy, and very liberal meritocracies. So uh, personal chemistry between the two leaders do not match well. That's my uh, 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 personal observation. Then Mr. Trump uh, came to power in uh, 2016, and Mr. Abe, he was uh, first uh, uh, one of the first leaders who uh, visited uh, Mr. Trump before Mr. Trump assumed the presidency in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, Mr. Abe visited Mr. Trump in New York. Since then, uh, so far, uh, Mr. Abe and Mr. Trump uh, have developed, uh, kept a uh, quite a uh, uh, good uh, relationship. Uh, I guess uh, Mr. Abe failed to uh, develop a quite close uh, relationship with Mr. Uh, Obama. So whoever uh, the next president was, even uh, not Mr. Trump, whoever the next president uh, of the United States, Mr. Abe wanted to develop a clo closer relationship with the successor of Mr. Obama than Mr. Obama. That was a personal motivation for Mr. Abe, I guess. And for Mr. Trump's side, you know, he has a very few friends in international community. So uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Trump needs uh, some famous friends in international community. And Mr. Abe uh, came to uh, meet him in New York for both sides, uh, uh, developing a good relationship was, ha, has been very uh, beneficial. So, so far, uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Abe has, have developed a quite close and uh, uh, stable relationship. This is a, a personal level. But, uh, uh, you know, however uh, the relationship between Mr. Abe and Mr. Trump uh, is close enough, uh, frankly speaking, many Japanese are very much uh, anxious or concerned about uh, Mr. Trump's foreign uh, policy. He is uh, uh, unpredictable uh, and uh, provocative. Uh, so uh, Japanese are, generally speaking, uh, uh, even though the personal uh, close relationship between the two leaders, uh, Japanese people in general have uh, anxiety, uh, concerns, about uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, then, nowadays, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, administration is taking a very tough uh, policy or stance uh, to China. So, uh, Sino-American kind of a new Cold War emerges in international uh, politics. So, I, I would say that now the Japan is between the United States and China, the two superstars, uh, su superpowers, not superstars, superpowers, uh, uh, Japan's situation right, uh, uh, right now is, in my view, somehow similar to the West Germany during the Cold War period. You know, ja West Germany was frontline uh, 
of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. And Germany was divided into two, two countries, right? And many German people are concerned about, are anxious, or uh, uh, fear, uh, someday, suddenly, a bunch of Russian troops may invade to their territories. So uh, West Germany was the front line of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. But during the Cold War period, Japan was, as a matter of fact, quite safe. You know, in the Asian Pacific region, American naval and air forces much more superior to Russian air and naval capabilities. So Japan was well protected by American uh, naval and air force superiority. So Japan was quite safe during the Cold War. That's why Japan could devote itself to economic development without paying a lot to uh, uh, military uh, budget. Japan was lucky. But the Cold War is now over, and European countries are relatively now very safe, except for uh, Im Im immigra immigration affairs, or uh, uh, epidemics, or uh, uh, global terrorism. But uh, major European countries are no longer concerned Someday, suddenly, Russians would invade to their territories. Uh, but uh, Japan is now in front, uh, between the United States and China, and North Korea is very much a provocative recently, and Russia is again uh, uh, very much assertive and provo provocative in the military terms. So Japan's situation is uh, uh, quite dangerous uh, after the end of the Cold War. And uh, although I said, Japan's position right now is similar to West Germany during the Cold War. Cold War. There are several, several differences. One is Soviet Union was one-dimensional superpower, only military superpower. But China is not only military, but, only, but, but also economic superpower. That's one, one uh, big difference. And the second difference was during the Cold War period, West Germany's economy was sound enough. But now, Japanese economy and the population is getting smaller and smaller. So our situation is much more uh, delicate and uh, uh, vulnerable than West Germany during the uh, Cold War period. That is uh, my view. And now, I guess the US is taking tougher uh, uh, policy or stance to China, uh, uh, Japanese feeling is, uh, I would say, somehow uh, catch-22 or ambivalent. You know, uh, security specialists or uh, uh, foreign policy circle, some of the security uh, specialists are happy for the United States to take tough uh, stance to China. Now the US is on our side. Finally, American establishment uh, getting realized, how, uh, getting realizing how China is dangerous. So now Americans are on our side. Uh, some of the Japanese security or foreign policy speci specialists feel so. But the Japanese business circle or uh, economic circle, they are very much concerned about uh, uh, the crash or tension between the two economic superpowers, China and the, uh, the United States. So Japanese feeling is uh, uh, quite ambivalent. And also, many Japanese people feel that even though Mr. Trump right now takes a quite tough position to, uh, to China, he may change suddenly. He may change suddenly. Then Japan will be isolated. So it is quite danger dangerous. So, uh, so in, in, in several ways, uh, uh, Japanese people's feeling about the tension between the United States and China are uh, ambivalent. And so now uh, Japan is uh, feeling typical, you know, the uh, fear of uh, entrapment between the two superpowers and the, also the fear of uh, abandonment by the United States simultaneously. That is uh, uh, a situation of Japan about the uh, sino us uh, uh, relationship. And I'm, I'm not a China specialist, and you have a, 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 a prestigious China specialist here in this university, but uh, my 
uh, basic uh, uh, observation is that as many people point out, the tension between the United States and China, not only trade issues, you know, uh, but uh, rather uh, over the supremacy of uh, technology and science in the long run. In particular, I would say information technology and bioscience are combined. This is a big problem. This is a big problem. The information technology and bioscience combined, then paradigm change may happen. Big data, accumulating the big data, uh, developing AIs and others, or uh, biometrics and these kind of things. Non-democratic, I would say, uh, somehow dictatorship is much more uh, uh, advantageous than uh, liberal democracies to promote uh, biotech and information technology combined. So something paradise, paradigm change may happen. During the Cold War period, the United States underestimated Soviet uh, uh, science and technology, but it was Soviet Union who launched uh, 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 artificial satellite, Sputnik, 1957. It was called to be uh, a Sputnik shock. So now uh, Americans are concerned about the possibility of second Sputnik shock uh, uh, in case of China. So it might happen. Combination of biotech and uh, information tech is much uh, favor to uh, Russian and Chinese than Americans and Europeans and Japanese. That is a uh, 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 big problem. But China has, of course, a lot of uh, weakness, in particular, population. You know, um, already Chinese uh, uh, working age population is getting uh, smaller and smaller. Comparing to 2015, 2030, Chinese uh, uh, population, uh, working age population will be decreased by uh, uh, 100 million from 2015 to 2030. Chinese uh, uh, working age population will be decreased by 100 million. And up to 200, uh, to, uh, 2040, 200 million decrease. The dramatic decrease of uh, working age population. And the many statistics, statistics or uh, future uh, projection uh, says that probably around 2027, Indian population will surpass Chinese population. And sometime in the early 90, uh, 2030, uh, entire Chinese population, not only uh, working age population, the entire Chinese population is getting uh, smaller. Uh, so uh, China is now losing the population. So uh, as many people say that, China may uh, uh, get into a trap, a trap, you know, before becoming rich, getting older. That is uh, uh, China's serious uh, uh, problem. So now Japan is, is suffering from uh, uh, more and aging and aging population and shrinking population, but probably 10 times larger than Japan. Uh, population problem, suffer, uh, China will suffer population problem. Uh, so, it is a kind of a competition. Whether China can overcome a lot of difficulties through uh, breakthrough combined by biotech and uh, information tech, or uh, decrease of population or surpass uh, China's success. Which one is the first? This, is, uh, uh, this will de uh, determine China's uh, destiny in future. So th this is a, a Sino-US relationship and Japan between them. And then Russia. Russia is uh, uh, getting more and more assertive. And Mr. Abe tried to uh, develop better relationship with Russia, uh, in particular, uh, tried to uh, 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 develop 
better relationship with uh, Mr. Putin uh, in order to solve the so-called northern uh, territory issues. But so far, um, uh, uh, the northern territory issues uh, cannot be solved in the near future. I, I, I have no intention to talk about the details of this uh, uh, complicated uh, northern territory issues. But uh, just one point is, speaking of the northern territory issues, difficulty is, you know, how many islands should be returned to Japan? This is one point, right? Uh, or, originally, northern territory is four islands, but nobody expects Russia will return four islands to Japan. The probably two islands maximum. But if we assume two islands are maximum, probably just one island, <laughs> right? Or uh, originally, Mr. Putin has no intention to return any island. So four, two, one, or zero, the number of islands, this is a one dimension of this problem, uh, uh, Northern Territory issues. But another issue is, Russians are asking to the, our government, what would you like to be returned? Talking about the Northern Territories, what would you like to be returned? It means, would you like, I, are you asking Russians to return Northern sovereignty of Northern Territories or administrative right, administrative right over the Northern Territory? or just territories, what would you ask to us to return? So the characteristic, you know, sovereignty or administrative uh, right, or just the territories, the how many islands, these two issues are mixed. So Northern Territory issues are very much uh, uh, complicated. And uh, as, I, as I will tell you later, uh, Prime Minister Abe's tenure as a president of the LDP, as a con consequence, as a, uh, as a Japanese prime minister, is up to September 2021. He will, he will step down uh, uh, at most uh, September 2021. But Mr. Putin's tenure is up to 2024. So Mr. Putin can just wait. Then uh, Mr. Abe will uh, 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 resign. So uh, uh, time is in favor of Mr. Putin, right? Uh, and uh, Japan, under Mr. Abe, uh, tried to uh, solve this issue through economic uh, cooperation with Russia. Uh, of course, Russia needs uh, economic cooperation with uh, Japan, but uh, nowadays, uh, Chinese-Russian economic relationship is much stronger and bigger than uh, Russian and Japanese economic relationship. So just providing economic aid to Russia, it will not solve uh, the Northern Territory issues, but it will not bring better relationship between Japan and Russia. Probably, um, probably uh, uh, if the, the US-Russian relationship getting better, then we have a possibility to, to improve Japanese-Russian relationship. But uh, unless US and Russian relationship is uh, in tension, it is very difficult only for Japan to improve our relationship with Russia. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a structural uh, constraint of a loose Japanese uh, relationship. Then, uh, let me briefly talk about uh, Japan and South Korean affairs. Now, uh, we have a very uh, difficult relationship with uh, South Korea. Yeah, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, it is also a very complicated story, but uh, historically speaking, I would say, when Japan normalized diplomatic relationship with South Korea, 1965. You know, two countries or two people had quite different views on history. On the one hand, the Korean people, you know, as you know, Korea was annexed to Japan, 1910. 
ジャパンコリアンペニスラはマージドトゥーザジャパニーズエンパイア1910スルーザインターナショナルトリティービトゥインザトゥーカントリーズそうオンザワンハンドジャパンスビューはジャパンスビューイザオウゾーアネクセーションオブザコリアンペニスラトゥーザジャパニーズエンパイア We understand it is it, it was quite a what shall I say Very much uncomfortable for the Korean people, but still, this was legal. Le legally justified because two sovereignties, two governments concluded international treaty. That's why the Korean Peninsula was、uh, annexed or merged to the Japanese em Empire. This is Japanese government view, you know. We understand the feeling of the Korean people, but legally speaking, legally speaking, annexation of the Korean Peninsula to Japan was uh, 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 justifiable. This is the Japanese government position, right? But Korean people's uh, uh, position is, of course,、uh, they are quite a,、uh, uncomfortable with the fact、uh, their country, their、uh, peninsula was forced to uh, uh, merge to the Japanese Empire. And also, they argue that this international treaty between the Japanese Empire and the Korean、uh, kingdom in those days、uh, was made under the military threat by the Japanese Empire. So, this is not legal from the beginning. This is the Korean position. The Japanese position was it was legal, although not so good, but it was legal at the, from the beginning. And when Japan was defeated、uh, in the、uh, World War II. Japan accepted San Francisco Peace Treaty. Then the,、uh, the annexation、uh, of Korean Peninsula to Japan became invalid. Right? Unless,、uh, until the San Francisco Peace Treaty, in,、uh, the Japan's annexation to Korean Peninsula was legal and valid. This is, this is the Japanese government position, very legal position. Uh, and the、uh, treaty,、uh, Japanese South Korean Normalization Treaty, Article 2 says that international treaty between the Japanese Empire and the Korean Kingdom, which decided uh, uh, annexation of the Korean Peninsula to the Japanese Empire, this 1910 treaty is no longer valid. Article 2. Of Japanese South Korean Normalization Treaty says that、uh, the, the 1910、uh, treaty between the two countries is no longer valid. No longer valid can be interpreted two ways. Japanese interpret, you know, original treaty was legal, but because Japan lost the war and just Japan concluded the San Francisco Peace Treaty, then the original 1910 Treaty was invalid. But Korean can argue that from the beginning of 1910, this treaty was invalid. Right? The both sides can interpret their own ways of Article 2 of Japan South Korean Normalization Treaty. So, for 60 years or so on, two countries, two countries uh, uh, enjoy their own interpretations under the same treaty. That is one of the historical causes of uh, our uh, problem currently. And secondly, I would say the, the United States is ally of both Japan and South Korea. But nowadays, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the Washington is losing its influence upon South Korea. So, US and South Korean relationship is getting weaker. That's why Japanese South Korean relation is also getting weaker. The US cannot intervene, Japan and South Korea, or the US cannot mitigate between the two allies' uh, uh, relationship getting worse. That's、uh, another structural uh, uh, factor, I guess. And、uh, I would say, I would say uh, aside from uh, purely legal、uh, interpretation, Of many things. Well,、uh, Japanese government position is, again, according to Japanese uh, uh, government, uh, uh, I'm a private citizen, so uh, uh, 
uh, uh, let, let me introduce Japan's government position. Relations between Japan and South Korea are currently strained due to uh, a dispute over former uh, civilian workers from the Korean Peninsula during World War II. Uh, uh, the, uh, the heart of uh, the problem is whether the problems made between our two sovereign states when they decided to normalize their relationship in 1965 will be kept or not. In 1965, after 14 years of hard negotiations, Japan and South Korea concluded agreement on settlement of problems concerning property and uh, claims and on economic cooperation between Japan and the Republic of Korea. Under the term of the 1965 ag agreement, Japan extended $5 million in grants and loans, a sum that totaled 1.6 times uh, as much as South Korean national budget then. All problems concerning claims between the two countries and the, their na uh, nationals were confirmed to be settled completely and finally. This is a legal term. So, so Japan's position is everything was already settled, legally speaking. That, that's Japan's position, and I, I, I understand this uh, legal position. But uh, I would say, in 1965, Japan was much richer than South Korea. Japan was much stronger than South Korea. In 1965, Japanese GDP per capita was $700. And uh, in 1965, South Korean GDP per capita was $100. So Japan was, simply speaking, seven times richer and stronger than South Korea. And in those days, South Korea was under the military dictatorship. So uh, people in South Korea could not express their own views on new relationship with Japan. So, I'm not a Korean, I'm a Japanese, but it is quite understandable for me. Uh, some Korean people feel that the, rela uh, the relationship right now, determined by the 1965 treaty, is unfair. You know, uh, the, the, the relation between the two countries is quite different now and 1965. We, uh, now, South Koreans are much stronger and much richer. So our relationship is much more flat, flatter one, right? Uh, so 50 years ago, Japan was so strong, so stronger than uh, South Korea. But now our relationship is much more flat. So our relationship must be change, uh, changed. I, I understand this uh, uh, South Korean uh, people's feeling. And I guess this feeling is somehow similar to some of Japanese feeling that, some Japanese people argue that Japanese constitution was imposed to Japan during the American occupation period. So, you, you know, the con constitution was imposed by Americans. Some Japanese people said that. So this feeling is somehow similar to the, uh, the feeling of Korean people right now. You know, power relationship changed. So we need a new relationship such kind of feeling is justifiable or unjustifiable, but at least for me, it is understandable. And uh, um, at least, I guess, uh, Japanese people and Japanese uh, government, I would say, uh, try to demonstrate uh, we are ready to accept uh, more equal relationship or friendship with South Korean government and the South Korean people. We, I guess we should uh, demonstrate uh, 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 such kind of uh, uh, stance to uh, South Korea. Otherwise, it is quite difficult to overcome uh, uh, the tension between the two uh, countries. And uh, uh, nowadays, uh, some Japanese people say that it's all right. Uh, uh, South Koreans never uh, uh, keep the international promises. Uh, we cannot trust the South Koreans. Uh, no longer South Korea. We don't need South Korea. Such kind of argument is extremely dangerous. Extremely uh, dangerous. You know, in terms of military budget, Japan is top 10, you know, 
in the world, and South Korea, 11 in the world. So South Korean military capability is not ignorable. South Korea, is, in terms of military, South Korea is extremely important entity or factor or player. So whether South Korea is on our side, means Americans and Japanese side, or other side, completely different international situations, security situations, uh, Northeast Asia. So we have, to, we have to try to improve our relationship with uh, uh, South Korea. It takes time. It, take, it takes time. In particular, next, uh, next April, uh, April of next year, South Korea will have a general election. So until then, I guess uh, uh, President Moon has a uh, uh, difficulty to make a, a clear compromise to Japan. So uh, South Korean domestic politics is also quite complicated, but uh, uh, it takes time, but we have to improve our relationship, bilateral relationship. And uh, uh, to what extent Washington try to uh, uh, mitigate our relationship is also extremely important. Then, uh, finally, uh, let me briefly talk about uh, uh, domestic uh, politics. As I told you, Mr. Abe's tenure as the president of LDP is up to September 2021. So uh, logically speaking, Mr. Abe could uh, stay in the position of the uh, prime minister up to September 2021. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Abe is very eager to uh, amend the Japanese constitution, in particular, Article uh, 9. Uh, Article 9, many people uh, uh, misunderstand, I guess, uh, Article uh, 9. Uh, uh, Article 9 uh, never says that uh, uh, Japan can Japan can, can uh, Article 9 never says that Japan uh, uh, does not have any right of uh, collective and individual self-defense and these kind of things. Article 9 uh, does not say such a thing. Uh, uh, and some, some people, even Japanese, mistakenly argue that Article 9 of the Japanese constitution abandons warfare. It is not, not correct. It is not the Japanese constitution, but United Nations Charter. United Nations Charter abandons warfare. You know, under the United Nations Charter, only two cases, you know, exercise of military forces are acceptable. One is self-defense. The second is uh, under, uh, under the resolution of uh, uh, Security uh, Council. And uh, uh, so any kind of warfare is illegal under the United Nations Charter. So it is not Japanese constitution, but United Nations Charter illegalized any kind of warfare except for self-defense and United Nations Security Council resolution. So uh, nothing particular, Article 9 of the Japanese constitution says that. What Japanese constitution, Article 9 says is, we will observe the United Nations Charter, you know? The Japanese constitution was uh, concluded in 1946. In those days, Japan was still occupied by the United States, and of course, Japan could not join the United Nations. But in future, Japan want to join the United Nations, and we would observe the United Nations Charter. That's it. Nothing more than that. Article 9 did not, does not say anything. We, does not have, we, we do not have the rights of collective and individual self-defense. You know, United Nations Charter says that any sovereignty has rights of collective and individual self-defense. And furthermore, some, some Japanese constitutional specialists argue, though, but it is quite inconsistent that although Japan can exercise individual, uh, individual self-defense, we cannot exercise collective self-defense. It is almost uh, nonsense. Uh, this argument assumes that exercising the collective self-defense is more dangerous than exercising individual self-defense. Nobody proves it. Nobody proves it. 
It is true, exercising the collective self-defense is more dangerous than exercising the individual self-defense. You know, exercising the individual self-defense means we do everything by ourselves. It might be much more dangerous than doing with others. At least, logically speaking, you cannot say that exercising the collective self-defense is more dangerous than exercising the individual self-defense. It is case by case, of course. Uh, but anyhow, Japanese Constitution Article 9 never says that Japan cannot exercise the collective self-defense. But, but anyhow, Mr. Abe would like to amend the Constitution, but my view is that I, I, I'm pro revising the Constitution, not only Article 9, but other parts. But uh, my sense is that, politically speaking, it is almost impossible under Mr. Abe. Uh, some say that uh, uh, last uh, uh, July, we have an upper house election, and the so-called pro-revising uh, constitution horses lost two-thirds majority. That without two-thirds majority, uh, uh, the, uh, the national di diet cannot uh, uh, propose the amendment. Uh, that's why uh, after uh, the July election of the upper house, uh, it is almost impossible to for the government to propose amendment to the constitution. But it is not a, a, a truly important point. Truly important point is uh, coalition governmental party, Komeito, is very much reluctant to amend the constitution. Even though two thirds majority are kept in, in terms of pro amendment forces, as far as Komeito is reluctant to amend the constitution, it is almost impossible for Mr. Abe to amend the Japanese constitution. So I do believe that Mr. Abe knows that under his leadership, the Japanese constitution cannot be amended. He knows it. And of course, opposition parties also know it. Opposition parties also know that. You know, Mr. Abe knows that he cannot revise the constitution, but he cannot admit so. You know, once he admits, okay, I cannot revise the constitution, then he will lose the influence, right? So he cannot admit, uh, I, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, amend the constitution. He must insist, I have to, uh, we have to try to amend the constitution. The opposition parties also know that Mr. Abe cannot amend the constitution, but they cannot say that. Because once they say that Mr. Abe cannot amend the constitution, then Japanese public say, uh, would ask the opposition parties, then why are you cooperating with the Japanese Communist Party? Right? You are cooperating with the Japanese Communist Party because in order to prevent very dangerous Mr. Abe's trial to amend the Japanese constitution. But if the possibility for Mr. Abe to amend the constitution is almost nothing, then why uh, Democratic Party and others try to cooperate with the Japanese Com Communist Party. They have a completely different idea of the emperor system and the US-Japan alliance. This, this is absurd. That's why the opposition parties cannot admit Mr. Abe cannot revise the constitution. Everybody knows that, but everybody pretend, uh, you know, uh, the constitution might be amended. This is, I guess, uh, my view, the Japanese situation right now, and, but, uh, the essence of Japanese politics right now is the, who will be the next Prime Minister of Japan. The game already began. The, the, the game already began. And uh, I, I wouldn't mention uh, uh, any name, uh, but uh, my guess is that if I were Mr. Abe, I would resign. I would resign before September 2021. You know? Next year, 2020, Tokyo Olympics will be held. You know, probably Japanese may be able to get a lot of uh, golden medals and silver medals. So well, certainly, Japanese nationalistic sentiment will be increased, yeah. right? So it is quite uh, 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 convenient or favorable for, for the governmental party, uh, Mr. Abe's size, and. Uh, Next year, November 3rd, this country will have the presidential election. 
Right? Then American domestic politics and Japanese domestic politics are connected to each other. You know, if, if, whether or not you like or not, if Mr. Trump should be re-elected next year, then Mr. Abe can, can argue that only the liberal democratic party under the leadership of Mr. Abe can keep the good relationship with Mr. Trump, right? Who else can keep a good relationship with such a difficult person like Mr. Trump, <laughs> right? Only I can handle Mr. Trump in terms of the US-Japan relationship. Then Tokyo Olympics and Mr. Trump will be re-elected in November, just assumption. Then Mr. Abe will go to general election. And uh, if LDP can win overwhelmingly, then Mr. Abe will enjoy a bunch of political assets, uh, resources. Then he will resign. You know, he will resign. Why he resign? Once he resign, he can, as a matter of fact, he can nominate, uh, he can name his successor. Then he can become a kingmaker. That is a scenario. But if LDP cannot win overwhelmingly, Mr. Abe's political asset will be small. So he may be not able to name his successor. Then confusion will happen, and the political struggle will happen in a Japanese political circle. This is a kind of a, a connection between the Japanese politics and uh, American do uh, uh, domestic politics. Let me stop here, and uh, uh, any question or any comments are welcome. Thank you very much. Professor Murata, you've turned out to be very popular, uh, and we have a large and mm. potentially unruly mm. audience here, mm. so I've been charged with uh, moderating the question and answer mm -hmm. period. My name is Phil Potter. For those of you I don't, uh, haven't met before, I'm the director of the National Security Policy Center, and we're co-sponsoring this. Um, let me get the ball rolling by mm. asking you a question while everyone sort of gathers their thoughts, and then I'll kind of point to some mm. students and, and get those ideas as well. Mm. I gave a similar set of talks mm. abroad mm. about U.S. policy, mm -hmm. and a lot of what you're talking about kind of reminds me of mm. that because you know, what, what I was describing was a very sort of complex and congested security environment. Mm. There are a lot of different mm. threads out mm. there that we're, we're tracking, a lot of domestic uh, pol political mm. issues that we're, we're paying attention to as well. Mm. <clears throat> mm. And then somebody at the end of it completely trips me up, and I'm going to try to repay the favor to you by saying, well, you know, what should the U.S.'s grand strategy be in this environment? Uh, mm. What should the, the ultimate objective be, and how are we trying to get there? And so I ask the same question of you in terms of Japan. You know, in this very complex environment that you're describing, mm. where is Japan, or as a private citizen, where mm. should Japan be trying to mm. go, mm. and mm. how can they get there? Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, recently, uh, some concepts such as HOIP, Free and Open India-Pacific, HOIP, Free and Open India-Pacific, uh, is very popular among the uh, policy circle in Japan and even in the United States, or some other uh, specialists often use the term of uh, strategic diamond. Strategic diamond means the United States Japan, Australia, and India. Uh, uh, this uh, consists of a strategic diamond. Uh, Ch China is getting stronger uh, with a lot of uh, vulnerability, and uh, uh, it is very tough to, it is, I would say, still uh, uh, tough to assert China is our enemy. It is still tough to assert. Uh, but uh, uh, China is getting stronger and stronger, uh, and China is uh, also uh, getting vulnerable and vulnerable, right? So this com combination, get China is getting stronger, and also China is getting uh, vulnerable, is very, at least, dangerous for the United States, for Japan, and probably for China and for the world. So how to, how to uh, manage China, which is getting stronger and which is getting uh, vulnerable? 
That is, the answer is, one answer is free and open Indian Pacific or a strategic diamond. Japan, uh, the United States, Japan, Australia, India, these countries share uh, the common uh, values such as human rights, democracy, the freedom of speech, or, or uh, uh, observation of a law and these kind of things. Uh, so uh, these countries cooperate each other uh, diplomatically and strategically and uh, uh, trying to not containing China, but uh, 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 preventing uh, uh, China from taking a quite uh, uh, provocative uh, diplomatic and military actions, and also uh, trying to uh, prevent uh, Chinese inner, uh, uh, not explosion, implosion, uh, all kind of things. Uh, that is, I guess, a uh, uh, basic uh, uh, concept or uh, grand strategy. Uh, and probably 2030s and two, two, 2040s, then uh, Chinese population is getting smaller, and China might be uh, more in accordance with uh, international norms or international orders, uh, or, or at least China is getting weaker. So, 2030 or 2040, uh, maintaining a strategic diamond, the United States, Australia, uh, Japan, and India, uh, uh, keeping China calm and safe. That is, I guess, a uh, uh, mid-term uh, uh, grand strategy for the United States and probably for Japan. Good, thank you. Question? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the speech. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the speech and for coming. Um, one question for you uh, about North Korea, because mm -hmm. we didn't, didn't get to talk uh, a ton about that. So I've heard the argument that uh, domestically, Japanese politicians um, sort of use the North Korean threat um, mm -hmm. as a placeholder in the sense that they don't necessarily want to call out China as a big threat. And so uh, the development of, you know, the ballistic missile defense system and, you know, the PAC-3 mm -hmm. system and all this is kind of uh, ostensibly in response to North Korea, but um, maybe it's, it's actually more about China um, and they just don't want to say that. Um, do you think that that is the case? And if so, to what extent? Uh, I would say to some, to some extent it might be uh, uh, correct. But uh, uh, to a larger extent, it is not correct, I guess. Uh, of course, you are right. Uh, uh, pointing out China is dangerous is very difficult. But uh, it's easier for us to point out North Korea is dangerous because they are developing nuclear weapons. Uh, they are against the uh, uh, Non-Proliferation uh, non Treaty, NPT. So it's easier for Japan and even for the United States to say that North Korea is dangerous than saying that China is dangerous. Right? Uh, so uh, th that is true. But North Korea is really dangerous. North Korea is really dangerous. They are developing nuclear weapons uh, and uh, uh, SLBMs and ICBMs. It is extremely uh, dangerous. But, but I would say probably perception gap exists between Japanese and South Koreans and Americans. You know, for the Americans, as far as, uh, uh, unless North Korea develops ICBMs, you know, Mainland of the United States, American mainland, is safe, right? But even short-range missiles, you know, Japanese territory is covered by North Korean missiles. And for South Koreans, you know, we are suffering from North Korean military provocations and North Korean military danger for more than 60 years. We are accustomed with North Korean military threat. But Japan, quite recently realized how dangerous North Korea is, probably since 1990s. So uh, perception gap over the North Korean military threat uh, exists between Japan, South Korea, and the United States. And North Korea quite wisely manipulate this perception gap between uh, these uh, countries. But uh, I would say, you know, uh, 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 I, I, uh, as I told you, Mr. Trump said that uh, uh, if uh, Japan should be attacked by other countries, we have to protect Japan. But if our country, the United States, should, attack, uh, uh, should be attacked by any country, Japan has no obligation to protect 
uh, uh, the United States, it's unfair. Mr. Trump said, but in case of Asian Pacific region, which country should attack the United States? Right? Who will attack the United States? Oh, you know, probably North Korea, possibilities. Russia might be, and China. The, if China or North Korea or even Russia should attack the United States in Asian Pacific region, the targets will be US military forces in Japan. Right? So from the beginning, Japan is also attacked with the United States. So we cannot just enjoy the event through the Sony TV. So Mr. Trump's remarks is completely wrong in this sense. We will be involved in military conflict from the beginning. So, uh, but anyhow, uh, and also, you know, if Japan should be attacked by North Koreans, conventional or uh, nuclear missiles and others, you know, of course, US military forces, uh, bases, and facilities shall be a target. And also, how many Americans are living, do you think, in Japan? How, how many American citizens are living in Japan? 150,000 Americans are living in Japan. It means equivalent to the entire population of this town are living in this town, uh, in, in Japan. So, meaning Japan should be attacked by other countries means that 150,000 Americans' lives and uh, uh, properties are in danger. Uh, so, the US is, uh, so, so in this sense, the Japan and the US uh, uh, share uh, the destinies. But anyhow, uh, we have a perception gaps about North Korean uh, threat. So, uh, they are manipulating. Uh, but uh, basically speaking, uh, they are quite dangerous. Oh, oh, no, no. <laughs> Can't dodge it. Please answer yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you, you. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, by saying that uh, uh, just territories, returning just territories of northern territories, <laughs> probably by saying that uh, just territories, there are several different meanings. As you pointed out, it implies not only uh, 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 territories, but also sovereignties, and of course administration, everything combined. That's one interpretation, you know. And, and sec second possibility is, uh, 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 in, in the northern territories, uh, for example, Japanese citizens can enter into the northern territories without uh, visas and passports, and in northern territories, Japanese companies and Russian companies co-develop uh, uh, new businesses, these kind of things. So Japanese, Japanese money can go, uh, go, go to northern territories. Japanese people can go to northern territories, uh, joint development, these kind of things. But administration may be uh, separated or shared, and sovereignty, uh, each side has uh, uh, its own favorite interpretation. That's possible. Yes. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, Dale Copeland at the Department of Politics. Um, I just had a question of bringing in the economic and commercial side uh -huh. to the grand strategy here. One of the most obvious points that make Japan and China similar is their dependence on raw materials, especially oil, mm -hmm. uh, coming from the Middle East, but also raw materials from, say, Australia. Mm -hmm. And uh, China has been pushing strongly with its naval buildup mm -hmm towards the Malacca Straits, and of course we have the whole dispute 
on the south china sea mm -hmm. now i want to ask in some ways a two part question here uh, do you feel that if the United States were to ask Japan's Navy, which is quite large, mm -hmm. to um, patrol the mm -hmm. South China Sea and help in the deterrence of China, okay. uh, would Japan go along with that or would it see mm -hmm. that as, a, as at odds with its traditional role? And the second question which is related is how does Japan see its naval relationship with India? I've heard that there are many talks going on between the two, mm. and is Japan probably in the future going to increase its coordination with India, per partly because it might not rely on the United States in the long term. If the United States, mm. for financial reasons, mm. debt problems, mm. decides that it wants to reduce mm. its role in the South China Sea and ask more of Japan and India. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first question about the possibility of Japan's uh, uh, joining uh, uh, a kind of a joint patrol uh, South, East, uh, uh, South China Sea or uh, so on. I, I, I would say probably it's quite uh, provocative to China for Japan to do so. And uh, it is dangerous even for the United States to ask Japan to do so. Uh, so uh, uh, Japan's, Japan's assistance may help the U.S. Navy, but, but much more dangerous to provoke uh, China by asking the Japanese Navy uh, joining such kind of a mi uh, minor uh, military operations. So I don't think Japanese uh, the U.S. government would ask such, rather U.S. would expect Japan's providing logistic supports and other, other supports. And in terms of uh, Indian and Japanese naval cooperation, I would say, generally speaking, uh, uh, promoting a strategic uh, diamond between Japan, the United States, Australia, and India, uh, not only naval cooperation, economic and other uh, uh, cooperation uh, will be promoted, generally speaking. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm far from a specialist of Indian affairs, and, uh, and again, I'm just a private student, uh, no capacity to, to represent our government. But my, my sense is that probably uh, now Japanese may over-expect India than reality. Uh, so, uh, the, you, you know, we, we can manipulate uh, uh, India, using India and uh, counter-hosting China and these kind of things. Probably we may over-expect India. And in my view, situation is something similar to 1970s or 1980s. You know, many Americans and Japanese talked about China card containing Russia, right? Uh, but uh, China was not a card, right? China was much beyond uh, just a card for the United States and Japan. And if we just think uh, trying to use India as an India card in order to uh, uh, prevent the, the rise of China, in future, India might be quite dangerous for us. So uh, we have to understand more about India. Uh, you know, over-expectation and uh, under-expectation, both dangerous. So we have to know Indian people and Indian society in the politics more and more. And we have to, uh, based on realistic uh, uh, estimates, uh, calculations. That's my view. Also, I'm quite an uh, amateur of Indian affairs. Thank you for your talk. Um, as you talked, um, the, today Japan and South Korea had a very, like, mm. a very bad relationship mm. today. And yeah, as you talked, it is basically based on the, its like, very bad like, memory, very, uh -huh. very bad uh -huh. history uh -huh. in, uh, like 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. But similarly, like, Japan fought very bloody battles against the United States mm -hmm. uh, Mm. It's 70 years ago, but like after after 1945, mm. Japan U.S. relationship had been like quite good. Like, but so what's the difference between Japan and South Korea? So in other words, how did Japan overcome that bad memory with the United States, 
and how did South Korea fail to overcome that bad memory with Japan? Hmm. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, 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 probably I, I cannot answer your question uh, uh, properly, uh, but uh, uh, you know, comparing to comparing the relationship between the United States and Japan, you know. We fought each other, and uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Japan and not, not only South Korea, but uh, Korea uh, as a whole, you know, Japan was defeated by the United States. It was clear, crystal clear, we lost the war. The US won the war. But in terms of Japanese and Korean relationship, which one won? You know? Uh, no, uh, Korea was liberated by the American forces, so uh, you cannot say that Korea won the Japan, right? But uh, Japan, uh, so Japan did not lose the war against Korea, uh, but uh, uh, Korea became independent. So uh, our relationship with South Korea, uh, uh, you know, our relationship with the United States much easier to understand. Who win, who, who, who lose? But the uh, uh, Japanese-Korean relationship is uh, much more ambivalent. Th that's one thing. And the uh, uh, second thing is uh, Japan's United States fought over the hegemony of the Pacific, and we fought through military strength, you know. Uh, but uh, Korea and Japan, not only uh, military matters, but also cultural matters. Japan tried to, I would say, uh, I, I, I cannot uh, uh, um, find a very proper English expression, but Japan tried to assimilate in Korean culture. So struggle between Japan and Korea is not only struggle over power, struggle over idea, struggle over culture, so much more complicated. So I guess, and also Korean people in history, Korean people felt kind of a supremacy to the Japanese culture, you know. Korean, Korean civilization, Korea is closer to the Chinese civilization, and we are superior to Japan. But Japan be became modernized, and Japan colonized Korea. So the, the quite uh, uh, ambivalent uh, inferiority and superiority feeling between Japan and the South Korea. And now, now, nonetheless, now, South Korea is catching up with uh, Japan, right? Now, 50 years ago, Japan was much stronger than Co Korea, South Korea, in 1965. But now, uh, South Koreans are catching up with Japan. You know, in terms of GDP per capita, within a few years, South Koreans will be richer than Japanese. You know, so for a long time, South Korean people felt a kind of an inferiority complex to Japan. But now they try; they are almost overcoming uh, these kind of feelings uh, to Japan. We we can catch up with uh, Japan, and uh, uh, even military. I would say, I would say, uh, some people argue that President Moon, uh, the government of South Korea, a very very uh, leftist. So uh, they, are, they are too much op optimistic about uh, uh, unification or reconciliation with a dangerous North Korea. It might be right, but uh, on the other hand, past 10 or 15 years, South Korea has tried to improve their own military capabilities and increase their, their military budget a lot. But uh, past 10 years or so on, Japan has not increased our defense uh, budgets. So uh, past 10 or 15 years, South Korea uh, tried to protect themselves against South Korea by increasing military capabilities. So they, are, they now have a kind of a confidence against uh, North Korea in terms of a conventional fighting, aside from uh, nuclear. But Japan, uh, for a long time, did not uh, invest uh, uh, itself for our defense capability and budget uh, uh, before Mr. Abe uh, uh, became to uh, be very assertive about security affairs. Uh, so, um, uh, so what in terms of North Korean danger, uh, conventional military danger, South Korea is uh, more confident than Japan right now. This is another uh, 
uh, I guess, a kind of factor. Uh, David Lai from the um, George Washington University as the adjunct professor and previously a uh, retired professor from the U.S. Army War College. I uh, really enjoy your presentation and uh, I appreciate your passion about your position <laughs> and not afraid to articulate it. I have been to Japan uh, many times. I have never seen uh, any other Japanese scholar as assertive as you are. Uh -huh and as articulate as you are. Oh, really, good job, man. I, I really enjoy it. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is a little kind of rhetorical and then the other one um, um, a little bit as well. The first one is that you talk about the power balance change uh, uh, that leads to relationship change uh, for, between Japan and Korea. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So um, given the power relationship, the power balance change between the United States and China, mm -hmm. and also Japan and China. Mm -hmm. So what would be your view on the relationship mm -hmm. change accordingly? Mm -hmm. So I'd like to have you for that, that's the first one. And then the second one is that you talk about the, um, uh, the campaign, the push, also the effort to amend the J Japan's Constitution Article mm -hmm. 9. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to ask you, uh, what specifically mm -hmm. is the LDP and um, Prime Minister Abe pushing for what specifically, uh, what, what kind of specific change? Mm -hmm. Is it the first one, the renouncement of the use of, of war mm -hmm. as a means to settle international mm -hmm. conflict? Mm -hmm. Or the second one, mm -hmm. that Japan cannot maintain military force? Mm -hmm. Which one specifically mm -hmm. is Japan uh, mm -hmm. wants okay. to change? Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'm not necessarily an uh, articulate, and I'm assertive because my vocabulary is very limited. I have to be assertive. Uh, that's it. I, I cannot express uh, quite a nuanced uh, explanation. That's why I, I, I provide a very simplistic uh, answers. Uh, so it, it's not my strength, but rather my weakness. But uh, answering the first question, uh, changing power balance between the United States and China, or uh, between Japan and China, and so I, so I, I would say, I, I do not think uh, China will uh, uh, get a kind of a, a global hegemony uh, or, uh, uh, beyond the United States zone, but the uh, power balance is changing. So Washington and Tokyo should accept this change uh, means that uh, we have to pay more respect to the rise of China, you know. On the one hand, we have to be very careful about the rise of China, but at the same time, we have to accept the fact of the rise of China. So, so again, similarly, my, my, my poor sense of history is that a situation is somehow similar uh, to the before the World War I, uh, the UK, the, I, I uh, admire the uh, British diplomacy a lot, but uh, before the World War I, I I'm afraid the uh, uh, British failed to accept uh, the fact of the lies of Germany. And uh, British treated uh, Germany as uh, uh, second-rated uh, uh, countries. Uh, that was at least one of the causes uh, Germany became uh, so uh, too much uh, provocative. The great powers, although we like or not, Great powers must be treated as a great power. And now China is a great power, whether or not we like or not. So we have to treat China as a great power. Then if China is treated as a great power, great power must behave as a great power, observing international order, observing international uh, uh, norm, and observing human rights and others. So uh, both sides should change uh, the perceptions uh, uh, in accordance with the changing uh, uh, power shift. That's uh, uh, my answer to the first question. And the second question, uh, 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 Prime Minister Abe would like to change uh, Article 9. And uh, mm, uh, 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 what shall I say? Uh, 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 not using uh, armed forces as a uh, 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 for the settlement of international disputes and so on. This explanation, uh, this e expression comes from Paris uh, uh, Treaty of uh, uh, 1921 or so on. Uh, 
so uh, Paris uh, Treaty of 1921 illegalized any war other than self-defense. Uh, so it means uh, Article 9 says uh, 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 Japan will abandon uh, armed forces, utilizing armed forces as a settlement of any international disputes means that Japan will abandon aggressive war. It does not mean Japan abandon self-defense. It is clear from the perception of the, uh, the context of international law. And the uh, 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 second paragraph says, says that in accordance with the previous uh, uh, sentence or paragraph, Japan will not possess armed horses. It means Japan will not possess armed horses in order uh, uh, conducting uh, aggressive war. So it does not necessarily mean that Japan cannot possess uh, any uh, organization or uh, military forces for protecting itself as a sovereignty. So uh, even under Article 9, Japan can uh, possess self-defense forces legally, constitutionally, and Japan can exercise the individual and collective self-defense, uh, the right of uh, uh, self-defense. Uh, but uh, but uh, to interpret so is a bit difficult for uh, average people, right? You know, uh, we have to know a lot of thing things. Uh, United Nations Charter says so, or you know, uh, inter Paris uh, International Treaty of 1921 says, or uh, uh, League of Nations uh, 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 says blah, 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 this kind of things. So it's quite difficult to understand or interpret Article 9 as I expressed. So in order to make Article 9 understand much easier for the average people, uh, so, um, Article 9 should be clarified or simplified. This is uh, one argument. And now, LDP and the Prime Minister Abe argue is not changing uh, the uh, existing Article 9, adding a new paragraph and uh, saying that uh, self-defense forces is, is self-defense forces are constitutional and legal. These phrases should be put. This is uh, Mr. Abe's idea, which I uh, do not necessarily uh, fully support, uh, but, but uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Mr. Abe's idea, uh, because in my view, uh, even without adding such a uh, uh, sentence, self-defense forces are certainly constitutional and le uh, legal, so uh, it, it seems to be uh, some, somehow re redundant, but uh, uh, LDP uh, tried to put uh, a new sentence, uh, but uh, not only Article 9, also lot of possibilities, for example, now, the upper house is too strong in the na na national diet. You know, prime minister cannot uh, dissolve upper house. Uh, 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 so once uh, opposition party uh, uh, get the majority in the upper house, you know, uh, every three years upper house election will be held. held. But uh, once uh, opposition party get the uh, majority in the upper, uh, upper house, the, the, gov the, the government uh, has uh, uh, so many difficulties uh, to conduct uh, uh, foreign policy and domestic policy. Uh, anyhow, uh, ha House of Councillors are so strong. Uh, so uh, some people uh, do argue that the, the uh, what shall I say, authority or capability of the House of Councillors should be more limited. Uh, that's one argument. And another is interestingly enough, some Japanese constitutional specialists and uh, uh, Japan's uh, law, uh, Lawyers Association, bar, bar, Japan's Bar Association equivalent, argue that the same-sex marriage should be accepted in Japan. Uh, but uh, Article 24 of the Japanese Constitution says that marriage should be based on the two sexes, and uh, two sexes, uh, and uh, the couple must be based on equal rights of the two sexes. So without, in my view, without changing Article 24, admitting uh, the same-sex marriage is extremely difficult, it's my view, but uh, constitutional specialists and lawyers says that without revising Article 24, we can accept uh, uh, the same-sex marriage. It's quite weird for me because they argue that under Article 9, we cannot accept the, uh, the right of collective self-defense. 
They argue so, but they also say that art, under Article 24, the same sex marriage is possible. It seems to be quite a double standard, or liberal or leftist double standard. But uh, in future, you know, among OECD countries, very few countries uh, 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 refuse uh, the same sex uh, marriage, uh, marriage. You know, among OECDs, you know, Japan, South Korea, Turkey, Poland, they do not admit, uh, accept the same-sex marriage. But they are minorities. In, in the future, uh, probably, Japanese might begin to talk about the possibility of the same-sex marriage. Then Article 24 might be ad, uh, amended. So many possibilities of the uh, constitutional amendment, not only Article 9. I was very interested in your comments about Japan-South Korea relations uh -huh. mm -hmm. and um, your, your description of how unique the South Korea-Japan mm -hmm. relation is. And it, I, it occurred to me that there's a parallel in Europe where Poland uh -huh. um, was not, did not defeat Germany uh -huh. in the way that South Korea did not defeat Japan. Mm -hmm. And um, they were previously very far below Germany in standards, but now they're catching up. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, mm -hmm. the, the Polish and the Germans have been able to dramatically improve their relations. We don't seem to have the same kind of tension that there is mm -hmm. between Japan and South Korea. Mm -hmm. And one reason is because uh, Germany, at the time it was unified, mm -hmm. decided to forego its claims on contested territory. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Pomerania, mm -hmm. and Germans had some historical mm -hmm. claim, but they said, we're not going to ask for that anymore. That made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And they also invited them into the EU, mm -hmm. and they started pooling sovereignty mm -hmm. as part of an international organization. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine Japan ever doing either of those types of things mm -hmm. to try to improve relations with Korea? Mm -hmm. Uh, given how important you just said it was to make sure Korea ends up on Japan's side. Mm. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, have, uh, I have to admit that I have never uh, imagined a kind of analogy uh, between Germany and Poland and Japan and South Korea. But uh, uh, with my limited knowledge of uh, European history, I, I do not know when the country Poland was created, when was that? Poland was created, uh, when was that? I, I think it claims to go back to around 1300 when it was yeah, of a course. greater of, power than of the course. Germans. Uh, but uh, who, after the World War I, yeah. right? The, the, yes. the, the Poland was cre uh, created again. Created, uh, get, getting together, right? But yeah. in case of uh, uh, the Kingdom of Korea, uh, the, uh, as a sovereignty, uh, uh, the Kingdom of Korea was, uh, has a much longer history than uh, uh, Japan. Or, uh, you, you know, yeah, the problem is, you know, Japan, Japan colonized not only uh, Korea, but also Taiwan. But in case of Taiwan, people living in Taiwan did not have the sense of the sovereignty in those days. But the people living in Korea had a strong sense of sovereignty. So their sense of sovereignty was invaded and violated by the Japanese Empire. But I, I don't know the relationship between Germany and uh, Poland. But I guess my sense is probably analogy is uh, the relationship between Japan and South Korea is much similar to the relationship between uh, Britain and Ireland. Britain and Ireland. And Ireland has a very deep tradition and culture. But, and, uh, Britain uh, invaded Ireland, killed many Irish people. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, the uh, geographical location are so close. Uh, so exploitation is, was so easy. So British Empire very effectively exploited Ireland. Japanese Empire, because of the proximity of, of, uh, uh, between Japan, Japanese Empire and the Korean Peninsula, Japanese Empire very effectively exploited the uh, uh, Korean uh, uh, people. Uh, so my sense is rather uh, British and I I I Irish relationship is uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, similar. But uh, uh, some, uh, I would say 
Of course, uh, uh, we have uh, many possibilities, I guess, uh, to improve our relationship, function by function. And uh, even now, uh, our bilateral relationship is in tension. For example, beyond the North Northeast Asian uh, areas, you know, Indian Pacific regions, uh, as far as I, if I'm correct, uh, Japanese maritime self-defense forces and the Korean navies uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, joint uh, uh, training about anti-piracy activities. So these uh, activities uh, uh, should be expanded and strengthened function by function. Th that's uh, uh, my hope. And uh, so many young uh, Korean people are now studying in the Japanese universities. And Japanese uh, younger people are also studying uh, Korean languages and uh, studying in Korea. So in the younger generation, uh, I, I'm, uh, I, I want to be uh, optimistic. <laughs>